one where we left off last week. Tonight we have a tremendous amount of uh, area to cover. We went through uh, three pieces of paper last week. This week we're going to go through about 15. We have a lot more diagrams. This is where we left off, showing you the code words and how you use the code words. And down here I have at the bottom some advice for using code words. And I showed you how to do it last week. We got to the circle and clapped around right and saw the code words fly around the room. And I do that kind of thing, I call those music games. And we have a lot more sophisticated music games, the Mary Max, right? Uh, things called eurythmic exercises. Uh, I take it poems put them together with patch clap claps. I'll give you an example of one in a minute. Um, this poem uses only two of the code words, but it uses one of them in the, the uh, quarter, the uh, eighth of it. It uses the eighth of the code word in a very unusual way to create syncopation. And we teach these things in our theater games. Next month, starting on the 19th of the month, we will have here every Friday evening from 7 o'clock on our theater and music games. And it's kind of what you saw at the end of last week's class. It's just the, the way we start the class. And we then take those games and build upon them. I use children's games and rhythmic games. Uh, a lot of that kind of stuff to teach people how to read and write, dictate rhythm. And there's a strong emphasis in my theater games on, on rhythm percussion and improvisation because it's a good way for everybody, singers, non-singers, dancers, everybody to relate musically and whenever you need a band you can throw one together in a few seconds. Um, then we also do the same kind of thing with voice. What we're going to learn in the last hour of this evening will be uh, how to read notes or how to read melodies by number. Now what, what I'm I call it by number, but what I'm really teaching you is what's in college called by interval. That is by interval distance. And in college, uh, you usually have to go through the first few years of A, B, C, D, E, F, G until they get to intervals. Then when they teach you intervals, everything gets screwed up in your head. Well, I'm going to get you screwed up in your head right away, so we don't have to go through that, that later and try to straighten it out. Uh, learning to read music by number is not difficult. If you can count up to seven and count backwards from seven, you can do it. Now, one of the reasons reading A, B, C, D, E, F, G is difficult is most of us learn that song to twinkle, twinkle, little star, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which I gave you a copy of. Well, we didn't learn to sing the song backwards. So being able to read going down the scale enables you being able to say the alphabet backwards. G F E D C B A. If you can't say it, G F D C A, that's why you can't read going down the scale very easily. And it takes people years to learn to read by, by, by a name of a note. Now I've discovered that everybody knows how to count from one to seven forward and backwards quickly, easily. And it's also easy to be able to, with your eye, with your ear, and with your hand, to guess distances, just like you can look at my hand and know that, oh, that's about five inches across. My thumb's about one inch wide, so that's two inches. By doing things like that, that's eight inches, or actually nine inches. Nine and nine, that's 18 inches. From here to there is three feet, so that's six feet. And by knowing that about myself, being a carpenter, I can pick up a plate set of plans to how to build a building. And I can look at them and say, oh, the plans are in a scale of 1 to 12. That means everything I'm looking at with my eye is 12 times smaller than reality. And for some reason, I don't have any problem of looking up at the empty lot and going, that's about a foot. <laughs> oh, this, this here is one inch? OK, that's about a foot. Well, there, that looks like three inches on the plan. Well, that's three feet. And I don't have any problem in my head doing that. I'm sure most of you don't. And that's all it takes to learn to read music by number or interval distance. To 
be able to guess by looking at something the distance between two objects. Now, because music's written on a graph, there's something, there's some stuff there to help you. And in the last hour of class, what I'll do is get into explaining how the graph system works, why the Western music graph system was developed, why I like it. A lot of modern composers have tried inventing new things, and I've putzed around with that myself. But as an overall system for describing music and all the different things in music, the system that's evolved is pretty good. And I think everyone should learn to use it well. Um, in college, the intervals are taught, you're taught magic code words like major, minor, augmented, diminished, etc., etc. We'll learn those more next week. But this week, we're going to focus in on just integer numbers, or whole numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, the do, re, mi scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, is it. That's called a major scale. And about 90% of everything that you read in music will in some way or another be based on that scale. So you can very easily, if you've got that scale in your ear and you know how to use and manipulate that scale, you can read most music that includes if it's in a minor key. You can actually read music that's in a minor key. You can read it in a major key and still play it and not have any problems. If you know the do re mi scale, and you know how to read it by number, then all the modes, the seven modes, are available to you. There's three different types of minor scales that are used. Those are available right away. So you have the three minor modes, you have, your, you have all your, your seven different modes that are used, and the diatonic scale itself. So right there, you've got half of music theory about scales under your belt. And then there's only slight variations on the major scale in order to give you all the other more esoteric scales of things that are used. And all of music history from about 500 AD, 500 BC, I'd say, up until about 1750s are all in there. The diatonic scale was used and what's called pentatonic scales, and all those modes were used in that whole time frame. So you've got some 3,000 years worth of music, essentially, that you can putz around with and learn to read if you've got the diatonic scale in your belt. From about 1750 to about the 1800s, a lot of work got done with chromaticism. And chromaticism is not much harder than diatonicism, except when we deal with chromaticism, we have to use all those other buzzwords, major, minor, perfect, augmented, diminished. And I'll try to explain what they mean as we go. First, I'd like to get back to rhythm, where we left off last week, okay? Saw the code words, you saw how we can use them together as a group to get them in your ear. Did any of you this week have any experiences, there I go with the heart Did any of you have any experiences uh, Hearing code words or something this week? I know Thomas did. Tell him your story. Um, I'm already background in therapy profession, which has its own code words. And up until today, when I started hearing translate, I couldn't hear or translate the Arabic stuff. But about three days ago, I was walking down Castro Street, past the Castro Station, and there was this good stuff coming out. And it was in front of me. Mm -hmm. yeah. One, 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 because of the number system that we're using, it does cause the senses to short circuit. As soon as you hear the code word, you suddenly have a visual impression of being able to write them, which is something that, that's where we all want to get with music. At least I feel that's where But today I got the Arabic stuff too. Oh, good. Yeah, Arabic stuff coming through. Anyway, I showed you the variations on code words. I gave you that little sheet. If you just keep working on it, 
Now I showed you, if you want to read music, first thing you do is you fill it in, you fill in all the syllables of the code words. And you try to say the code words to the meter, to the meter, or to the pulse. Try to get it some kind of a steady pulse going and get the code words moving. Okay? And that will help you get it together. It's important that you get through the whole piece. So if there are some rhythmic pieces in the piece of music that you're having problems with, just replace them with rests and go past it until you learn to get the whole piece. And tonight what we're going to deal with is whole pieceness. For the first, the next 45 minutes, what I'm going to deal with is what we call song form and ways in which we can take the code words and build the code words up into song. Or if you had a poem and you got the code words to the poem, then what do I do with it? How do I turn that into a song? So we're going to deal with what's called song form tonight. And it's important that when you're trying to practice a piece, that you get through the whole piece so you can get out of the detail of what you're dealing with and learn to hear the whole piece as a big chunk of something, telling you a story, and learn to break the story down into its subparts, like outlining the story, like reading a story, the Reader's Digest, and then sitting down and writing an outline. You know you've just read an outline, and then you're going to outline the outline. And actually, you can do that in, at infinitum uh, quite easily in music, and one should learn how to use that writing technique. So, if there's a part in the music that you cannot play right away, or you don't know the code word to it, work it out later, replace it with rests, skip over and go through it. So you learn to get the whole piece, which is important. Another thing is, sometimes the piece that you're looking at is really made up of a couple of code words in some combination. If you can isolate them back into the main code word, for instance, I will go with this. Might as well try out our new technology right now. Okay, uh, some code words, for instance, we were doing this. Some code words are made up of pieces of code words. This could either be a number, you see, or it could be it could be diatonic. Either one. Well, if you can't quite get it together, replace this whole thing with either one of these. It doesn't matter. Replace it with the whole thing. Now, what I always recommend is, if there's a lot of fast things, always replace it with the thing that gives you the most detail. Which, in this case, if I played this as, instead of um, tonic, um, tonic, diatonic, diatonic, then these two pieces here, at least, diatonic, diatonic, will be happening right. And then later, I can try to figure out the front half of this. But if I can't play that, replace it with this whole thing and play it as diatonic. Why wouldn't the first note be one? Could it be one? You're saying it's uh, Any of these could be anything, depending on what the meter is. And they're, what they are is they express a ratio. And depending on which one of them I want to use as the number one, to determine their ratio. I could make an eighth note one beat. Then these would act like eighth notes. Two of these still equal one of those. They still have the ratio of two to one. So here you have two sounds, and here you have four sounds, so the ratio of two to one. The ratio is the same. If I make this one beat, and that's one beat, then this is going to be two beats long. And that's one way of figuring this out. You can what we call augment the rhythm. You can change the rhythm to its next larger component, and you can move that up again. I'll show you that in a while. That's one of the techniques we use for writing. But you can you can take this thing and you can rewrite it or readapt it. You can replace it with the whole code word that you know how to how to do and get past that. So the rhythms on either side, coming into it, coming out of it, are right. After a while, you'll you'll get that how to do this. It's you'll, it's really not hard. It just requires practice. And what happens is, uh, first thing that happens is one number in a diatonic pop into your head. Those are the first things you start hearing. And then after a while, you will begin to hear, uh, oh, num tonic and diaper. And after a while, you begin to recognize a butter. That's about the way it happens for everybody. You know, 99K. 
cases, it's about the way it comes in this, those kind of levels of consciousness. You get your so we use that, whatever level of consciousness you're on, you reduce the music, you rewrite the music, so it's at your level of consciousness. So you should perform it, because what's important is performing it. Not whether you're uh, necessarily correct or not. You'll see, as I'm saying, these are rate express and ratio, and they're not fixed anyway. And these are not God. This is not carved into the tablets handed by Moses down to us. Music writing is a very, very poor imagery of the sound that we're after. It would be as if I put a bright light on all of you people and cast your shadow on the wall. I could recognize her from him from her from him by the shadow on the wall. But you want me to believe that the shadow is your total substance. It's all that you are. And in a way, that's what this is. These are only a shadow of the substance that the composer is trying to get at. But the music itself has its own, it has more substance. There's more substance to it than the music writing entails. So music writing, music writing in general, the notation of music, only in some way or another tries to point you in the direction of the kind of unique sound that this composer had. And hopefully, they, lots of composers have developed lots of ways of doing that. Some require that you live in their house, eat their food, take baths and showers with them, walk in their shoes, and be them for a period of time in order to figure out what that means. It has little to do with the notation system that they developed. You have to really try to feel the music itself by itself. It, this will give you a clue. It says, okay, you're going to go in the woods, but I want you to take the right fork instead of the left fork. And if you take the correct fork, you're going to wind up in any particular meadow. Where in the meadow? But you'll be almost there. It's up to you in praising and interpreting it to take it further. And it's, you have my permission at least to re-alter, bend, shape, and rewrite anything you come in contact with so it's usable. Because if it's not usable, well then what the fuck good is it? The whole point of music is to communicate through the act of doing it. So you've got to, you've got to get a handle on it. Uh, the next thing is, look, if there is, if, if you're doing a piece of music and the meter changes every few measures, for instance, some composers will, uh, a friend of mine, Bill Russo, who is a jazz musician, uh, loves to write things for classical musicians, in which it'll start out in 3-4, and it'll do a couple bars, and then it'll change to 6-8, and do one bar, and go into 9-8, and do one bar, and go into 5-4. <clears throat> when he changes meters like this all the time, then what's important is not to try to practice all the little tiny nuances of sound inside, but to practice just the meter. And practice counting. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And you practice the meter itself. And the most important thing about the meter is where one lands. Since in all meter, when we're counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one starts the whole thing. We can consider that the thing that activates the beginning of the meter. And the other things just establish the length of how long it's been activated. So in a sense, the first thing is masculine. The second thing is what they call feminine. And they break rhythms into masculine and feminine gender. And the masculine part of it in Western music, at least, always occurs on the one or the beginning of it. It sounds the beginning of the measure. So that's why there's this emphasis to accent one. Well, I found if you just listen to one and nothing else, that helped hold it together. I go, one, two, three, one, two, three. I can, I can make the three speed up and go even faster. So if you're practicing an odd meter like this, only practice where one occurs. Practice counting. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, four,
three, one, two, three. You can, you can break this, remember I was showing you, you can break anything down into two and three. This can be broken down into uh, two sets of three, which is related to that. And this can be broken down into three sets of three, couldn't it? So I could think one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. One two one two three 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 one two one two three one two three one two three one two three one two is the is the pulse going to remain constant regardless yes. of the ratio? Sometimes yes. Most times yes. The pulse all you have to do is pulse is undifferentiated. All you have to do is find the pulse for a particular unit of any measure. That's right. Unity. That's right. Yeah. So in a sense, it's always related back to unity of pulse. All you're doing is breaking ratios by that. You're counting. <laughs> yeah. All you're doing is counting. Mm -hmm. um, you have two, four, and six, eight. One's double the other. Seems to be. One's going twice as fast. You can just think of six, eight as two sets of three. So what you're doing in that case, what he's talking about is this. We have a problem with 3, 4 of this fraction here, and 6, 8. 8 is half that, right? So in a sense, this is occurring twice as fast as that. So what that simply means is change this. Make this
What are you doing all this? So what, we all say. So what? Since rhythm was really ripped off from language and not the other way around, and what I'm trying to do is get it back to being learned through the language and make you realize that the language is important, to show you how important it is, something that most people are not sensitive at all in music is what I call music form or music structure. Now, this is the biggest lesson. I'm only going to be able to go over this once, but you can use these concepts of music form on rhythm, which we're going to do. You can use them on melody. You can use them on harmony. And actually, you can begin to build a piece of music with any one of those three. If all you've got in your head is a bunch of chord changes, you can write a song. If all you've got in your head is a melody, you can write a song. If all you've got is a rhythm, you can write a song. If all you have is a poem that you've written, you can figure out all the rest from them, and you've got a song. You can take any element in music or any piece and construct the whole from it. And this is dealing with how do I deal with the whole? And these are tricks or gimmicks that we're going to use to help us organize and construct these bits of data that we're playing around with. Okay? Now the first thing is rhyme scheme. Rhyme schemes, you know, are used in poems. And there are just oh, a, a couple simple ones that are used a lot in music. I'm going to demonstrate that. The first is called endline rhyme. Well, we all know that. Roses are red, violets are blue. With a face like yours, I should live in a zoo. And the blue zoo rhyme. It's the words at the end that rhyme. Sometimes every stanza, the words at the end can rhyme. Or sometimes they'll do things where they'll skip over a stanza, right, and have every other rhyme. But the point is they will construct different ways of putting lines together in which the thing at the end of the line somehow or other rhymes something else somewhere down the line. And some poets construct very elaborate rhyme schemes. <coughs> For instance, this might be a line. Mm -hmm. I can uh, take this line and I can do this. I can blue encode these two guys, right? Then I can orange encode these two guys, right? And then I can uh, yellow encode these two guys, and we have makes sense tell stories, rhythmic stories or something that makes some kind of sense. Let's take this end line rhyme, for instance. Let's say you know, we're going to do a typical rock and roll, and everything's in four. So all any four cards will make a new rhythm. Okay, so let's call this our, uh, our C. Bum, 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 ya da da da. Doesn't sound like a complete sentence. Sounds like it wants to go somewhere else. I could have made this a complete rounded out sentence, probably by doing something like that. Bum, bum, yup, bum, bum. Bum, bum, yup, bum, bum. Bum, bum, yup, bum, bum. This sounds like a period. That one makes it sound like a comma. Whenever anything sounds like a period or seems as if it's ended, started and ended, we call that a full cadence. Full cadence. Okay? When anything sounds like a comma and doesn't seem to end, wants to go on, but has some kind of ending as to it, your voice drops slightly, we call this a half cadence. Half cadence. Now, what I'm going to do is... Uh, I think I'll make this a full cadence. So we have one tiny little four, four unit something. If I were to build a longer line, I might put this here and then put four more out here and make an eight measure, actually make a, sorry, make a two measure line. Right now I'm building 
four beats or one measure line. This is my end. This is the thing I want to rhyme. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to create another line that does not rhyme with this one. Okay? Although I did use a trick. Bum, bum, yum, bum, bum, yum, bum, 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 da da dum bum. Those lines are identical. Those lines are identical in terms of the rhythmic ratios I use. Here's a ratio of one to two. And I did ratio one, one, ratio two, ratio one. Here I did ratio two, ratio two, four, two. So this has the same ratio as that, you'll notice. And constructive-wise, it's identical. And what it does is it gives you some feeling as if it's similar because of that, but it's different enough. There's enough variation that it seems like an independent line. Bum, bum, yup, bum, 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 yet da da dum bum. Now let's call this whole thing phrase A. Now what I want to do is I want to create phrase B, which is going to rhyme with this. Okay? So I might go This next thing here, the only thing I considered was end line rhyming these guys, just like I did on the blackboard. In other words, this whole code word here is the same, and this code word here is the same as that one I really want. So now I get two sentences. The end of each part of the sentence is rhyming with the one that comes after. And here, I did something more with a construction, which here I tried to avoid. I could have very easily gone uh, number, number, diatonic, number, done this guy again, or I could have gone like this, mirror imaging this guy again, right? That works. But I decided, well, don't get too trite. Maybe there's something different. You can think of fields of symmetry in any direction you want, and then try to fit whatever field of symmetry you have inside of this other field of symmetry, and suddenly you'll get something that makes sense. So now I have one, one. Constructed a part A and a part B, and part B is related to part A through N line rhyme. No different than I would do using words. I'm trying to find words that rhyme. I remember when I was a kid, I spent hours trying to think of words that rhyme with orange and <laughs> things like that. Called frontline rhyming. 
And you'll notice that I did that automatically already without even realizing I had rhymed this with that, and I rhymed this with that. Because in my head, that symmetry obviously made some kind of sense. So what I have is also front line rhyme here. And I have front line rhyme and I have end line rhyme, which really makes this thing even more sprightly as a unit. Now I could break up this rhyme back here if I wanted to. Now we pull this thing together at the front line line. Bum bum yet dun bum 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 da 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 dum bum 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 da 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 dum da da da. And now these guys are holding it together because of their rhyme scheme. And this is an example of front line line in which purple over here matches purple over here and light blue here. Matches light blue here. Still using this very tried simple poetic technique that usually works for music. It's a you know, it's a gimmick, but it works. It works quite well. Quite well. And indeed, composers do these things on an unconscious level all the time. Now, um, I was able to construct two sentences related to each other through that. So we have an inline rhyme and front line rhyme. Now, you have front end line rhyme, which was the last set of cards I had down there, where the front line also ended with the with each other, and the end line also rhymed with each other. And sometimes composers will do some real fancy constructions on that one, where they'll have, oh, this one will be yellow, and it won't be until you get down to here get another one in the front that matches. And inside, they'll have this guy in with that guy and this guy in with that guy. And then what happens is, this whole thing here now has the feeling as if it's one, one thing with its little right scheme going on. And then this whole new section down here that's pulled in gets tied in because of this. So now, we can create the light blue, light blue, brown, brown construction, which is different than this one down here, but uses the same pattern. And by making this rhyme with that, pull this whole thing together as one unit. And then it happens again. You can use any kind of these types of constructions that you want with music. All you simply do is make sure that this make sure that these guys here on the end, and this is a number, that's a number, and if this is a uh, one, that's a one, and now I can put whatever else in between there I want, could I? And this whole thing here would sound like it belongs together. I, I extended or made a larger construction just by using that technique taken something that by itself wouldn't be enough, I've been able to stretch out, what do you call that when you make it larger like that, augment the uh, structure by using these techniques. Now this is what, when you write, take your poem, and you figure out what the code words are, probably the rhythms will be doing this if the words indeed do rhyme. If you're using some kind of rhyme scheme, the rhythms rhyme also. But you can sit down and plan a newly rhythmic rhyme and then fit words to that or write your melodies or your harmonies off of that. Okay? My favorite is what I call tail eating. Tail eating is used in blues and it's one of the finest improvisational techniques that I know. What tail eating implies is that The end of my construction, it suddenly goes blue. I just simply blew in the beginning 
with a piece of this and then take off with my next color. And then end it with some other color and then pick up with that color and move it into another color and then end it with some color and then use that as the beginning of the other. And so what happens is the end of this and the beginning of that are almost identical. Or this is some small piece of this. If we can call this VAR, this might only be the R. And I call that tail eating. It's like a snake eating its own tail. Well, I'm so lonely, I'm going down that lonesome road. Going down that lonesome road is mighty painful to take. Taking myself back to my baby out in Wonderland. Wonderland sucks because I'm... <laughs> you know, and in, when I do improvisational theater stuff, I encourage people to use the tail eating technique because once you said a sentence, you've got half of that sentence to la la around while you're trying to think up the next thing to say. You see? And as a matter of fact, a good chorus will la la this ad infinitum while you're going on constructing a few sentences. I'm going down that lonesome road, lonesome road, lonesome road, lonesome road. My baby's hard to take, taking her back, lonesome road, lonesome road, to wherever, 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 wherever. <laughs> right? Often in the chorus, the people in the background just take one word, two words, or some part of this thing, and they just spin it around and spin it around. Meanwhile, the other person's busting the, their head, figuring out how to tail eat their way through the story. And you can take any story you want and break it up into a small outline and then tail lead out the outline. And what you're doing is what we would call in opera recitative. Well, I'm walking across the room. Here I'm standing in front of you teaching you this class. Teaching this class is sometimes a drag because I have to try to keep you awake and keep myself awake. Keeping myself awake works better when I'm using sugar. I wish I had some sugar. <laughs> and it becomes a real easy technique for making up. Oh, let me take sugar and cream. Thank you. So again, I can do the same thing down here. If I let this rhythm here start with that one, end with something else, start with that, whatever I end with here, I start with over there, can you see the construction? That's eating that, that's eating that, that eats that. Tail eat. Boom, boom, jump, bum, bum, boom, jump, bum, get it, get it,
just becomes a process that is describing based on our definition what we mean by equals. So if we say equal always equals we say zero equals zero and we define the function of equality as balance between two sides of the equation and we define this function brain likes to work in functions. It likes to make the rules of counterpoint, depending on some other slim definition that we create somewhere else. I say music must be this way, and based on that I can have other functions. Well, I've discovered in my study of dreams in Freud that there are only four functions that the brain does, which is one of the reasons why there's plus, minus, times is some kind of plus, compounded plusing, and divide is a form of compounded minusing. So that's still only two functions. Thank you, By the way, I, did you notice her uh, mafia widow that I have seen? <laughs> is being 
being used by that, so I have these other parts of the diatonic over here that I can use to write with. And then here, this guy knocks out that guy, and this guy knocks out that guy. So I have a uh, ick. Uh, ick. Now what I have is I have this other whole rhythm that I've generated, which is the space, or the gaps, that's left from this rhythm. And from that, I can generate other rhythms, which I call inverted rhythms, for other players. So if I have two or three people playing together, they're not really playing at the same time. They're playing in the cracks of each other. And whatever cracks are left, I've got all that time to fill it up with another musician. Yeah. So could you write the end result of that talk line? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, you'll find this is a very powerful technique for figuring out other parts to something where you don't want the parts to collide and create harmonies. Uh, your guys are sitting around, you've written the song, and all of a sudden a, a horn player shows up and says, gee, I want to play horn for your band. And we well, sorry, we've already written all the parts. But what you can do is you can go through the parts and you can find out what spaces are left, and automatically that'll give you a whole bunch of rhythms to choose from. And you can then write a trumpet part that kind of laces itself in between here. Or you can find some kind of a rhythm that the trumpet could play that in some way or another would incline itself in between here so it, it comes out, you can hear it. It's not playing at the same time the bass guitar and the drum and the are playing. It wedges itself in between it. Ideally, backup does that a lot anyway. That's what the Coco girls in the background are doing when they're saying, somebody says, oh, I want to die. Want to die, want to die, want to die, 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 What they try to do is take what they're doing rhythmically and fit it in between because they don't want to talk on top of the solos. So often they'll do what we call off-beat or syncopated stuff. Die, die, he's a die, die, die. Well, the other guys go, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. I'm dying. <laughs> It helps to isolate or separate the voices. So no two people are singing at exactly the same time. And I have all this space left over that I can use up. Why not have some event occur on every 16th note of the music? If I have three different players, I can have all three players use up all that time. Um, I didn't catch exactly what you said. I got the uh I'm just saying I can fill up this whole measure with total sound. If I had three musicians and I wrote for one musician another part that fit in here and then wrote another part that fit in there, I could have every single diatonic. Diatonic, 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 going on all the time. But it would be broken up between three or four different musicians. Which are the original number on the top. This will determine what's left. It takes up the first two uh, beats. Yeah, yeah, right. You got you got the sixteenth in there and the sixteenth in there. Mm -hmm. You got three sixteenths in here. You see, and all that all that room in there. It requires looking at the inverted image of the thing. See? And what you can do is you can uh, work it out to any resolution you want. I could uh, I could have said that actually I'm going to think in terms of only number. Number, 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 you know. How coarse or how fine do I want to make the, the, the uh, crosshairs that I'm using to weave my rug with? I could think of what's left being 30 seconds and have eight note possibilities in between these two sounds. So basically you're just resting. Yeah, where when the original line occurs, you're just resting on that, and you have all that other space in there to fit something. So that's inversion, inverting the rhythm, getting its mirror image, if you will. There's another system that I use. There's called augmentation and dimin diminution. Augmentation is when we make something larger. I can take this whole scheme here, which takes four beats, and I can write all the rhythms twice as large, so it will take up two measures or eight beats. In other words, I can make this 
guy here, which normally only gets one pulse, I could give him two pulses. And then these guys, which normally only get a sixteenth, they get four pulses, I could give them, make these two numbers twice as big. And then I could make this guy two beats. I make this guy one beat, and this guy one beat. Now what I have is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I have two measures of this same rhythm. It's been augmented in time and made larger. And all I do is multiply everything by two. Double its size. I could double this. I could double this and make this a whole note, which takes up a whole measure. And then make these four quarter notes. And then make this one a whole note. And make this half note and a half. And now I just augmented this. Now this is one, two, three, four, boom, 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 da, 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 da.
think of this as one long sentence.
dealing with the lar an even larger shape. Now we're going, you notice we started with undifferentiated pulses and then we figured out that those pulses could be divided down. And what I've been doing in living is showing you the larger, the larger, the larger scheme. Now we're going to go to the biggest scheme, which I call the long line. And the, long, the larger the scheme that you can make your mind see, and still see some symmetry in it, you're going to be able to uncover and decode music pretty easily. These schemes are used a lot. The first is, the simplest, they call AB. AB. This is used by Bob Dylan a lot. It's used in folk music. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. In the jingle jangle morning, I'll come following. La da da di da 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 di da di da 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 di da da di da 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 di da. La da 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 di da 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 di da 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 di da 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 di da da. Just goes A B A B A B A B A B A theme. They vary. my building 
building is to the people next door. And in my building, the step, the doorway is here, and the steps come down like that. And then right here, we have a bay window. And then up here, there's a bay window. And then there's a little utility window over the porch like that. Of course, on the building next door, it just so happens that the stairs are over here, and they have a bay window on this side. And of course, up here, there's a bay window. And then over here, there's a little flag. And between the two buildings, this one being a mirror image of that one, creates the A, B, A, B. Now you walk around the city, and you look at buildings, or you look at buildings next to each other, and you look at the way a whole block is laid out sometimes, and it's just like this. ABA is the most used theme in architecture and any other song form that I know. And this song form is also used in classical music a lot. In the duet, or the rondo, rondo is something like that. I just thought, ABA. And then there might be inside of this A, an ABA. Inside of this B, a CDC. And inside of this A, an A variation, B variation, A variation. See what I'm getting at? And I can take these guys, theme one, theme two, and spin them out. Oh, thank you. Right. So I can take these and spin them out as those guys, well, however I want. They've got the A thing. Bum, bum, get the bum, 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 get it a dumb bum. A thing, B thing, dumb bum, 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 get the dumb. Back to this. Bum, 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 bum. Now there is a whole piece. Also, that would be four. Here in the ashram, 
we believe in sugar and caffeine and nicotine <laughs> as being help stimulate it that way. <laughs> when you get a, uh, there's something about the sugar molecule that destroys your body while it agitates your consciousness. So as your brain is thinking that your body is burning <laughs> itself up, Change the 
into what I call a rhythmic curve. And this curve, in some way or another, although it doesn't have the exact notes, the curve represents the melody I had in my mind. And I can see this da 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 da. I know that's what it is. So I put that in my pocket, and I get off the plane, and the city blows my mind, and I go home, and I take it out of my pocket, and I put it in a drawer, and I go about my life, and four months later, I go and I pull this little thing out of my drawer. <laughs> and I go, do re mi fa so do da 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 No, that's not right, but that's the right shape.
number and value are all the same thing in this case. The, what the musicians often refer to as a note, it being a note or a pitch, referring to some name on the keyboard over there. Um, uh, scientists and electronic engineers, we call it frequency quite often. And they give it word, catch words like hertz. A, the pitch, A on the piano, to a scientist is 440 hertz, or 440 cycles per second, or 440 times per second. That is, frequency is measured in count, or number of times per second, and that number is a value. So they're, they're all saying the same thing. So melody has something to do with value or number. And pitch can be represented as frequency in terms of cycles per second, which is a number. Or I can use any kind of number scheme or any kind of name scheme that I want. I can say star, circle, square, triangle, and give you seven symbols. Or I could use seven colors of the rainbow and say every note starts on red and moves up to blue. And if you know your seven colors of the rainbow, you can learn to read notes by using the seven colors of the rainbow. Figure out how the music graph corresponds to your color system and go right ahead and learn music. I don't care. Just as long as you learn to read. I don't care how you read or what how you want to learn to use to read. Just read. And also, the ultimate goal of reading is to not be able to have to read anymore. Once a musician gets to that point where reading becomes a very natural, organic thing, they forget how they read. I don't know anymore. I had to relearn. And then after I relearn, right now I can't tell you which system I use for reading some things. Some things I read by ABC, some things I read by 1, 2, 3, and some things I read by color. What do they do? I think of B flat as blue, C sharp as red. So if I hear something in C sharp, hits my head. Yeah. So I say, that's a red key. That's a blue key. That's an orange key. And sometimes I might personalize certain colors of the rainbow to certain keys. That's okay. That works for you. Invent your own how. I use numbers because numbers are the simplest how that I know of that expose the process of music. And that's because melody is pitch, which is value. It is a number. Now, there are two ways of reading pitch. One way is what we call absolute pitch. And this is where I come to the piano and I say, this note is A. I give it an absolute name. This point is A. That's your reference point. Now the whole rest of the keyboard in some way or another is going to be related to A. And that's an absolute value. Or a scientist might say, well, A is 440 hertz, 440 cycles per second. So if I play this A, it's 440 hertz, but if I play this A down here, it's not the same note, as far as the scientist is concerned, because it's 220 cycles per second. And although it's exactly half, it's an even multiple of this, well, if a musician wants to call 220 hertz A, that's their business, but it's not, no self-respect the scientists. And we're going to call it 220 hertz. In other words, they have a fixed concept about it. In some way, or I can point at this and say, this is a green blackboard and it is on this wall, here, now. If I want to be that absolute about it, fine. But to me, there's something reeks of that. Because you see, this here, now is changing, isn't it? And this floor is moving because it's on the planet Earth. And the planet Earth is revolving around the sun. And the sun is revolving around the galaxy. And the galaxy is revolving around the universe and that's all falling. So here now is really here now. Where it was a while ago is something else. So things aren't really as absolute as some people would like them to be. Absolute has to do with having a small frame of reference. If I just say everything in this room that happens is real and everything outside is not, this becomes my frame of reference and I can make absolute judgments about where I'm standing and where you are, stuff like that. But I have to have this one stationary point, which becomes my absolute frame of reference, and which everything else in this room is going to be measured to me. You can think of music that way, and music is taught that way, but I don't find that to be a modern point of view. A modern point of view about melody is that melody is relativistic. Now, relativistic would be like the names do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Do can start
start on any absolute pitch that I want. And then I can create what's called a scale, which means ladder in Italian. I can build a ladder or a series of steps, and I can make the steps precise sizes. And that size ratio is relative, and I can move it anywhere. I can build the steps from here to here, or I can build the steps from here to here, or I can build the steps over there. And when I build the steps, once I have the steps, the ratio between each step will always remain the same. That's relativistic. But I can set the stairs in equal right ratio. So we have those two points of view about melody. One point of view is the absolute way of reading melody. This is an A, 440 hertz. Or, we're playing in the key of A, therefore A equals Do. And now I can go Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, And Do can be anywhere. And when I'm singing Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, I'm singing ratios. Those intervals have a ratio between them that is exact. It's the same all the time. And it doesn't matter where Do starts, what absolute name I want to give Do, it will be relatively the same. That is why we have what we call an equal tempered scale. And the big advantage to an equal tempered universe is a relativistic universe. And the beautiful thing about a relativistic universe is everything is dancing and everything is in motion. And every point in, the, in that universe can be the center of the whole universe. And every point cannot be. You see? Now, if you learn to read music that way, relativistically, you're freer. And the nice thing about learning it relativistically is you only have one set of rules to learn. That is the ratio. And once you learn the ratio, you can put that ruler on anything. And it'll work. But if I'm learning music through absolute, then the high A and the low A are really different and I have to learn the names of the cycles per second for each note in the high A scale, and the cycles per second for each note in the low A scale, and the cycles per second for each. So I have seven separate scales that I have to remember for the scale A for the seven octaves on the piano. Now there's seven modes in those seven, so that's seven more things to memorize. There are actually 12 chromatic notes, so I have 12 scales. And I could go crazy trying to think of all the permeations of those numbers imaginable. And by using absolute ways of relating to it, I am then stuck having to memorize all that stuff. But if I learn it relativistically, all I have to learn is do re mi fa so la ti do. And everything else is going to come out of that. And what I can do is I can show you how 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 can generate every scale and every chord and every harmony and every modulation imaginable. And if we reduce it to just those seven whole integer numbers, it would be very easy to learn to read. The only thing that we have then in melody and in dealing with melody isn't just the pitch, but we have the pulse and the meter. We have the pulse, which is the time, and we have the meter, which is the count. And if we add these things together, which also have a value, and we're using code words, together with the value of pitch, in other words, you put the code words together with moving them up and down, we now have melody. We take rhythm, and we move the rhythm up and down in pitch. Now, certain kinds of grammar and constructions automatically happen when we do that. And the study of melodic motion helps us learn harmonic modulation, harmonic motion, the reasons why things feel the way they feel, and all kinds of stuff can come out of the study of melody. And when we are trying to play melodies, what is very important in playing a melody is the phrasing, or the touch, how loud and soft it is. So we have basically three elements. We have the timing elements, which are the meter and the pulse. We have the touch, 
how loud and soft something will be, and that has a lot to do with the expression, the emotional expression of what we're doing. And we have the pitch. And you put all these things together, and what you get are, when I was talking last week about the sentence and the words in the sentence don't matter as much as the meaning that I'm trying to convey, the notes, the names of the notes, don't matter as much as the timing, how loud or soft I play them, how fast or slow I go. So, if something in music, we have these three elements, and each of those three elements have a duality. Element number one is upness or downness. We call that interval of pitch. So the note goes up or down. And you have to practice up and down. And up it has a certain feeling. When you move up the scale, it gets exciting. It's like raising my voice, you know I'm getting excited. But as I find it, I don't know. So going up a scale tends to make us excited or add energy. And going down the scale by itself naturally gives us a tendency of relaxation. If I'm a good musician, I will have to practice going up the scale and getting bored. And I will have to practice going down the scale and getting excited. They are not natural. And they are skills which I have to develop in order to control them. Music. So I can start by going up and down and using the natural tendencies of up and downness. And then I can do the unnatural thing with up and downness and develop control. Another thing I have to consider in dealing with melody is how long or how short the note is. Whether it's a quarter note and occurs on every pulse beat is not as important as how much of that quarter note is going to be activated with sound. And if I only allow a small fraction of that time to be activated with sound, I have a short duty cycle. We call that staccato. Instead of going ba, 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 I go ba, 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 all that time with no sound. And that's staccato, duty cycle. But if I extend it so that two thirds or more of the time is filled with sound, it stops being considered short and starts to be considered long or legato. So we have staccato for short and legato for long. And a quarter note can be staccato or legato. And we have to consider this to be cycle. So I can phrase it as Back about 16. 
1500 AD up until about the time of Pythagoras, they had no way of writing down what they were doing. And then from the time of Pythagoras, with his ratios, they began writing down melody lines as a series of mathematical ratios. And some of the melodies were taught as mathematic ratios from one pupil to the other. And a lot of the scales that were handed down, the tunings, were handed down by word of mouth. And they still were, didn't have any system for being able to notate it other than writing about their experience. But to notate the sound itself, they didn't have any way of doing it. Now, as I said earlier, lots of people experimented with lots of different ways of doing that, but I don't feel that any of them are as versatile as the system we now use. In order to understand Western American symbolism and how it relates to these three different elements of melody, we have to analyze the three different kinds of bar graphs, line graphs, and circle or pie graphs that are used in normal business to do something. Now, one kind of graph, if I were doing some banking and I wanted to put my money in the bank, the amount of money I have, that is, whether I have money in the bank or don't have money in the bank, can be equated to pitch. As the money increases, the pitch increases, and as the money decreases, that <coughs> decreases. As the money increases, my power increases. As the money decreases, my power decreases. Same thing happens in pitch. Frequency equals power. The higher the frequency, the more power or energy in the pitch. The lower the frequency, the less power or energy is in the pitch. And that's a standard conservation of energy and matter in physics. Okay, the number of days that I'm entering things, every day I decide to do my bank account, see how much money I have in there today, or how much I took out today. Those days could be equated to the pulses of the music or the rhythm. The days become the rhythm. Okay. Then weeks. If we look at our account, the money that we have in it from day to day, okay, we will not necessarily learn anything at all about our spending strategy. We might learn something about how much money we have now. We know how broke we are or how rich we are. But we haven't learned anything about our total experience of our spending strategy. And in order to do that, we must extend the time frame, mustn't we, to a longer time frame. And in a way, meter becomes that way of doing that. Or I call it phrasing. Phrasing is when we look at the B theme. And we try to have the melodies that we're doing follow the A theme. So the A theme is a story by itself. It starts as a middle and comes to an end. And that would be like looking at weeks of our bank account and figuring out our spending strategy. So these equate in some way or another loosely to music. Now, I can take these variables, money, days, and weeks, or pitch, rhythm, and phrasing, and I can look at them in a number of ways using the kind of graph systems that we use. One is the bar graph. With the bar graph, the amount of money that I have is represented by the height of the bar. And the days are the position of the bar along this x, y axis. Of course, when, whenever you have an x, y axis, one of the first things you have to do when you have a graph is you have to decide where zero is. Where does the graph start? If the graph starts in the upper right-hand corner, or uh, the upper left-hand corner, or the lower left-hand corner, it has to be defined. So your reference point, your starting point, becomes essential in being able to build a bar graph. Then you have to be able to increment your x axis in a series of increments. In this case, we might use dollars. Every slash going along here might be a dollar. So we could draw something like Quantity of the money that 
in some way or another represents that money at that time. Now the nice thing about bar graphs is that you are not stuck only representing one kind of money. What if some of the money that I put in my bank has to do with uh, my Visa or Master Charge card? And what if some of the money that I put in my bank has to do with checks that other people send me? And what if some of the money is real cash? What do I do if I want to represent these three different types of money? Plastic, credit, real change, or paper that someone has written to me, I have used, that someone has written to me. Well, I can do that in a bar graph by representing the value up as a different color. And I can say, well, I have this much here is in credit. This much here is my uh, uh, cash. And this much here is in checks that other people have given me. And if I do it with three different colors like this, I can develop a bar graph in which I can look at any one of the three or all three of these at once simultaneously. I can look here at my credit, and I can see how my credit has increased and decreased over a period of time. Or I can look at the red lines here, which have to do with uh, the amount of cash that I had in my account. And here the amount of cash decreased, even though the amount of credit increased. And here the amount of credit increased, but the amount of cash decreased. And then the next day my cash increased, and here, here I just got paid on Friday. These could be the checks other people gave me. On Monday here, I, I have quite a few checks, and you'll see on Thursday I, I received quite a few checks because everybody else was expecting their good check on Friday too. So they wrote me a lot of checks, but during the middle of the week I didn't get any checks. So now I can look at all three of those values, which have to do with the pitch, if you will, at one time. And when we look at a bar graph, what we are seeing is what we would call harmony in music. Each of these could be a different note. And we could stack these notes to occur simultaneously in time over each other as values. And then play games of recognizing them individually or in relationship to each other. Now, if I did it here as a series of dots, what we get is what's called a line graph. And a line graph is not good for representing harmony or three different events at once. It's only good for representing one event in relationship to the whole graph. And in a way, this is the way we perceive melody. This would be one melodic note, the next, the next, the next, the next. And there's two ways in which we can look at this. We can compare the number here down, or we can compare it to the last value, couldn't we? I could say, well, here I have $10 in my account, here I have $20 in my account. Or I could say, well, I have $10 more in my account than I had last time. And in one case, I'm reading by dropping the line to the reference point and saying, oh, there's $40 in my account. And in the other case, I can say, oh, well, there's $15 more in my account than there was yesterday. Where I'm relating it back to my last point. And from point to point, I can read the value, which I call relative reading, or I can find its absolute value in relationship to the baseline. This is also used. We call it melody. Melody is like this. Now this is the trickiest one. It's called pi graph. What pi graphs do is they show you percent of something, or duty cycle. Now remember, duty cycle was rhythm. And rhythm is, rhythm is stored in the music notation as a percent of value. And that's why the code words are not fixed mathematical entities as much as they are relative to each other. And depending on what becomes one second will determine how you use all the others. And I could make any one of those icons, any one of them, any value of one that I want. And then the ratio of all the rest to each other take over at that point. And in a way, rhythm is one of the ways in which we read pi graphs. We store time value or percent of something. Legato and staccato is a pi graph. A 
represents the percent of the whole. So if I have one whole second, which is one whole quarter note, and I, I want to represent a staccato note, then I'll draw a thin pie, thin wedge of the pie to represent staccato. Or if I want to represent the whole note, I draw a whole pie. Okay, now, the nice thing about these is they all have some reference point. And from that reference point around, or up or down, or left or right, we're going to measure all the other events. And actually, music, writing, does all of these. Let's examine the bar and the line. Music puts the bar and the line together in a scheme like this. And I've turned it sideways so as to fool your senses easier to, to look at. If I said to you, oh, this space right here is one. Okay? And then every line in every space is going to be a number. So if this space is one, then this line is two, this space would be the number three, this line four, that line five, this line six, that line seven, and if I say we're only going to count up to seven and start over, then 8 becomes 1 again. So the next space is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 becomes 1 again, starting over. So moving this way, I would be increasing the numbers, or going positive, or going up in pitch. It'd be like putting money in my account. And going this way on this graph, I'd be going down the steps or down in value, or decreasing the money in my account. And now I can measure, just as we did in the line graph or in the bar graph, I can either measure the absolute points between two things, like this, or I could read them in terms of their reference point to one. You see, if this is my reference point here, I draw five lines and six spaces there, and five lines and six spaces here, on either side of it, I can measure the distance from here to there. Or I could measure the distance from this line to that line. Or I could measure the distance from this space to that line. Now when I'm doing that, I'm reading melody in key. When you're reading, comparing something to a Crick's reference line, you're reading in a key. The absolute, the name of the key becomes the absolute zero reference point in which everything is being measured away from and back to. But if I'm saying to you, well, what's the difference between 4 and 6? Then I'm only reading between these two points. And when I'm doing that, I'm reading relativistically. And now their relationship between each other being something, just as I said in this graph, well, this is $10 and this is 20 but it's also just 10 away from what it was yesterday. And when you do that, you do that more in melody than anything else. If I read from point to point to point to point to point to point to point, I'm reading melody. But again, I can read melody those two ways. I can read them as distances between points, or I can read them as a fixed distance from a reference point. You see, the bar graph and the line graph allow us to do that quite easily. Now, there's some rules that just kind of naturally happen when we do that, which I'll explore in a little while. There's what I call odd rules and even rules. The numbers can be broken down into odd numbers or even numbers. And things that you do with odd numbers don't happen with even numbers and vice versa. Let me give you a real simple example of that. I don't, I don't know how many years I went to school before I found out that zero was an even number. Do you know that zero was an even number? Yeah. I thought, well, zero wasn't any number. <laughs> zero is a number. And if they draw this line graph here, this algebraic line graph, and this is plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. And you can go this way, right? Minus one, minus two, minus three. Now, if that's odd, even, Odd, even, odd, even, odd, tailwind. So zero is even. Now I can make up rules if 
about oddness and evenness in man. That actually, I don't know why I don't teach you this in school, because this will help you guess the answers to things. What happens if I add 2 to 4? Or if I add an even number to an even number? What's my answer? Even number. It's even, right? And what if I add 1 to 3? Or an odd number, an odd number to an odd number? If I add an odd number to an odd number, or I add an even number to an even number, I always get an even answer. So there's two probabilities for getting an even answer. As a matter of fact, the only time that I get an odd number is if I have an odd number, odd, odd, odd. If I have three odd numbers, then I will get answer. But if I have two even numbers and one odd number, which is an odd number of odd numbers, then the answer is odd. The only time I get an odd, an odd answer is when I have an odd number of odd numbers. In any other case, an odd number is one number more than an even number. So if I have two odd numbers, one more plus one more is two more, makes an even. But having an even number of odd things makes it even. So you have three possibilities in math. One possibility is to get an odd answer, and two possibilities are to get an even answer. You'll notice that in almost any mathematical proposition, even occurs more probably than oddness. And so if you just guess an even number, <laughs> Off the top of your head, the problem may be correct. It'll be very close to correct and be correct. And if you want to learn to do super math, guess at the answers. And knowing that you have this going for you, if you guess an even answer, you're going to probably be closer than if you guess an odd one. And you'll know it's going to be odd if you just add up how many things, how many odd numbers are being used in the formula. If you have an odd number of odd things, then guess any old odd number and you'll be close. Probably right. Well, the same thing happens in music. In order to get on with this, I'm going to skip by this. And I want to show you, this is how the pie graph is represented as rhythm. If I use a whole pie, I have a whole note. And if I put a line through a whole pie, I divide the whole pie in half. If I have a whole note and I put a line on it, I now have a half a note. Vice versa, work also if I put a line through it, like this, across it, I am now reducing it to a quarter piece of a pie. Well, in music, the line going across is akin to filling it in. And now I have a quarter note. The only reason that we use this fraction is because when you have a whole something, a whole, that's a whole number. That's a whole number. <clears throat> that's a whole number. And if I let the whole number represent this, and it would work, it doesn't matter what it is. If I said this, so this is a whole piece of the pie. Now when I cut the piece of pie in half, I have reduced its value by half. So this is now, that's a half. You reduce the fraction, works out the same. Yep. Now if I put a line through it, I've made a quarter piece of the pie. I fill it in. You reduce that fraction, it's still a quarter. But I call it a two-eight note. It works. Now what happens if I put another line through it? Ah, oh, something happens. I don't get an 8, do I? And what happens is I have two pieces here that are one size, and these two pieces that are different sizes. Well, that happens, believe it or not, when we go from one to number to harmony. Oh, you see the same? 
same thing happens if I cut this and try to make this one sixth. It doesn't work. In order to make it perfectly one sixth, I'd have to readjust the lines in there, see, and draw. I couldn't go like that on this cut. I have to go like that on that cut. I have to adjust the line a little bit in order to get six equi pieces. And in order to get six equi pieces here, as I do here or here, I have the same relationship mathematically of this to here as I would here. If this were, oh, if that were one quarter and that were one eighth, this would be one twelfth. See, and that's what we have here, one twelfth. Each of these fractions of this piece is one twelfth of the whole pie when I'm using harmony. If this were, oh, if that were one quarter and that were one eighth, this would be one twelfth. That's what we have here, one twelfth. Each of these fractions of this piece is one twelfth of the whole pie when I'm using harmony. And you'll notice that the reason harmony feels as if I shifted gears is in order to make all those pieces round, they in some way or another don't relate to this. I had to adjust the lines, shift gears, in order to make it fit. Now, if I go and stick another line in here, on this, oh, now I'm going to shift it back again to get my eighth notes, or in this case, to get my sixteenths. If I take this thing and I divide it up like, like that, I've got to shift it back. And this, I can take this whole note, put it on top of there, no problem. I can take this and put it on top of there. But I can't take this and put it on top of there. I'm going to get more A patterns with the line because everything's been shifted slightly. See, that's what's happening with the rhythm. And the reason they use these fractions is because they're talking about pies. And what rhythm is, is it's a way of representing fractional numbers, whole numbers, or the pie chart. Basically, any one of these numbers could be, if this was a whole number, this is a half, and so on and so forth, I could make this a whole number, one, and this gets two beats, and it gets four beats, this gets a half a beat, that gets a quarter of a beat. The ratios remain the same. No matter what one I want, if I say that's one, that's a value of one, and this is going to be a value of two, that's going to be a value of a half, that would be a value of a quarter, and you see those ratios stay the same. Relative ratios. Relative ratios. Not absolute. They're relative. And, but all you have to do is simply remember this very simple rule is you start with a whole circle, which is your whole note, and every time I do something to that, I'm cutting its value in half. So if I put a line on it, I'm cutting its value in half. If I fill it in, I've cut its value in half. If I put a flag on it, I've cut its value in half. And if I put another flag on it, I've cut its value in half. And if I put another one in half again, and another one in half again, and that's how rhythm really works. It's some kind of pie chart. And this is an old English way of representing it. You'll find that a lot of this stuff is really stylized in writing. For instance, the clef that we use is the way the old English used to write the letter G. They used to write the letter G's with fancy little things like that, you know. But after a while, somebody said, well, let's not go that way, let's go that way. <laughs> what we got was the letter G. And so this clef is the G clef because it's the letter G. And it doesn't look like the letter G because we don't write in old English anymore. But boy, if you lived at the time of Shakespeare, you would have recognized that as a G right away. How this, let's look at the odd and even rules and see how we can use them to read easily. Okay? Odd and even. Relative, first. From here, we're just reading between each other. My rule 
principle is, if a note goes from a line to a line, or it goes from a space to a space, it's going to be an odd number. Just that simple. That's all you have to know to read music. Nothing else. If it goes from a line to a line, or it goes from a space to a space, it's going to be an odd number. So what do you think happens if it goes from a line to a space? Yeah, what if it goes from a space to a line? It's an even number. Let's check it out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay? If I say that is 1, 1, 2, 3, from a space to a space, 3. If I say this is 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. By jumping over a line, I've gone to the second odd number. One, three, five. That is a distance of five, or what's called the fifth. Going from space to space, got to be an odd number. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or I can think three, five, seven. Odd, odd, odd. If I go from the space to the space to the space, every time I'm jumping from space to space or jump over a line, I'm jumping to the next odd number. Now that would also be true, by the way, if I were on an even number. Say I said to you, this, uh, this number here is the number 2. Well, then that has to be 4, and that will be 6, because we jump every other number. Okay. Even though I'm starting with an even number, I still jump an odd distance to the next space, which would be the next even number. And I jump an odd distance to the next space, which would be odd distance. So whenever something looks the same, it's generally an odd number. And whenever it changes from line to space or space to line, it's generally an even number. Or what we're doing when we go from line to line or space to space is we're jumping over a number every other number. Let's uh, check this out. It goes from a line to a space. So it's probably going to be an even number. If this number here is 1, and we'll try and see how far away that is, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Sure enough, that's a distance of 6. From a line to a space, must be an even number. 1, 2. That is what we would call a second. From a line to a space, got to be an even number. Let's try it this way. 1, 3, plus 1, plus 4. As a matter of fact, if you get kept jumping every other line in your head, just jumping every other number, you can find out how far something is very easily. As a matter of fact, what you should do is, like a carpenter, you should get this inch here in your eye and know that this always a third. From a line to a line would be a third. From this line to that line would be a third. Get the third in your eye. And then you'll know a fifth because it'll be twice as big. And you'll know a seventh because it'll be bigger than a fifth. And you'll always be able to see it. And what you want to do in learning to read music is see that distance and name it right away. See the distance and name it. See it? Maybe. And you do that by getting the size in your eyeball for a third. And once you know the circle of thirds, or every other number, then it's real easy to read. Okay, what if, on the other hand, well, let's just go on. That's a second, from there to there, that's a fourth, that's a third, and from there to there is a fourth, from there to there, it goes from a line to a space, it's an even number, it's two. From here to there would be a fourth. You see, it's not that hard. Is it? That's all you have to do to read music. You shouldn't let it confuse you more than that. So it just went on in your head, is it? Okay, now if I'm comparing, if I say 
I want you to read in fixed key now. That means let's compare all these things to that line. And if that line becomes a number one, then we can count up every other line. One, three, five, seven. Then this becomes eight, or the new one. And that line now becomes an even number, two. And going backwards from one, we would count the space would be seven. The next line would be six, five, four, three, two, one again. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one again. You'll notice something. One, three, five, seven, two, four, six, one, three, five, seven, two, four, six, one, three, five, seven. So when you're trying to read in a fixed key, what happens is over a two octave range, you will first go through all the odd numbers, and then you will go through all the even numbers. Here's my Ubernatch super fantastic grandstaff. This is the Ubernatch staff. You see it has no spaces and no reference points and none of that other stuff. And I come up here and I say to you, okay guys, gals, X marks the spot. X marks the spot. We're going to call this line here one. Now right away I can lay out the graph. Going up, that's three, that's five. That's seven, two, four, six, one, three, five, seven, just like that. And going in the other direction, it would start out going down even. From here to this line would be six, four, two. You see the pattern? Every other note. And then after seven, it repeats itself. So the these and then, these lines now become the even numbers. We rotate through the odd numbers up to seven, then we rotate through the even numbers, and now up here, from here, line, all the way down here to this line, within two octaves, we've gone through all the numbers, every other note. And it starts with all the odds, and then it goes all the even. Now if I send to you, Okay, what's the distance from here to there? Nine. Nine. Right. Another way of looking at this is one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and look, fifteen. We'll write that on one again. And in music, when you're reading chords, you can read up to, and including, a 13th. And you cannot have a chord larger than a 13th. The reason is, chords are built by going every other line, every other space. And in two octaves, you wind up right back in the key that you called it. So you can't have a bigger chord, or a bigger every other space than 13. And a 11, the number 11, is another way of saying the number and nine is another way of saying the number two. This becomes very important when we study harmony. But if you're just reading from one to seven, then this becomes one, two, three, four, five, seven, and it starts over. One. You've got to work on this a little, but not much. Really, it doesn't take too much to understand that. Yeah, but that's basically the way it works. So if I say, Okay, here's my reference point. This is one. That note's one. And this is two, three, four, five, six, seven, octave. Do one. And counting backwards, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Or, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. There's two octaves from Do on the line, all the way up two octaves to Do on the line, and in between Do get a space. That's it. Now if you get this, and you practice reading these interval distances, 
get a lock in your eyeball, you'll find it pretty easy to do. And the first thing you want to do is you want to learn to read intervals by melody from point to point to point to point. And when you read intervals by melody from point to point, you won't have a jump over an octave. You won't get a number bigger than eight in most cases. anything at all in harmony or melody, you're going to have these two ways in which you can read the intervals. One way is you read the intervals in terms of their fixed relationship to a key. Now I put two sharps up here, ignore it. Just imagine they're not there. What these two sharps do is these move the reference point of where one is, and that's all. And all sharps and flats in the key signature do is move where one, or do, starts. That's all. If you can find out where that one is, you can start reading music in that key, okay? So, I'm just telling you now, X marks the spot. This note here is one. So this song starts on the third step of the scale. So I'm ready, me. And if I start on the third step of any major scale, me, and sing three, two, one, three, two, one, Five, four, four, three, five, four, four, three, five, eight, eight. You know the song? Da, 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 da. Three blind mice. Now, if I'm playing, always relating it down here to this fixed reference point, I then call the, ne the name of the note by the interval in comparison to the key it's in fixed relationship to that zero reference line. And that's the easiest way I know to read. And whenever you get lost, you can always find your way back by looking at the next note. Another way of reading melodies is to read relativistically. In this case, we read from point to point. I don't tell you where this point is. I just say start playing. And you see that you move down a second. Then you move down a second. See, then it jumps up a third. Down a second. Down a second. Up five. Down two. Stays the same. Down two. Up three. From space to space. From space to line. Down a second. Stays the same. From line to space. Down a second. It's going to jump from space to space. Five number. Three. It's going to go from space to line. Even number four. So now I can read this song by saying, starting anywhere, da, go down a second, da, go down a second, da, come up three. 